Hello, everyone. My name is Hassan Tariq, and I am working as a webinar coordinator for EERI Younger Members Committee. I would like to welcome all of you to a today's webinar on a broader topic of Explore Innovative Teaching Methods in Science and Engineering by two talented speakers, Diane Moggs and Anahid Behrozi. A few logistics before moving ahead. The slide shows a screenshot of the attendee control panel. You can click on the orange arrow to open and close the control panel. You will be muted throughout the whole presentation, but you can ask questions for the presenters by typing in the questions pane and clicking send. We will address questions at the end of the webinar. Today's presentation will be recorded and will be available in two weeks at EERI YouTube channel. Now I'd like to give you the brief background of Younger Members Committee. The Younger Members Committee provides opportunities to early career professionals within EERI organization to advance their career as earthwork professionals and become more active in the institute. The co-chairs are Azra Jampal, Maha Kinavi, and Ashley Morales. The slide reflects the summary of YMC activities. We are doing very exciting events throughout the year to foster the professional development of younger members. If you are interested in joining us, then please do not hesitate to contact us at ymc at eeri.org or visit us at our website. Now, without any further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Diane Mogg. The topic of her presentation is incorporating demonstration into engineering classrooms and outreach. Diane Mogg is an assistant professor in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at Portland State University. Prior to joining TSU in 2017, she earned her PhD at the University of California, Davis in Geotechnical Engineering. She teaches geotechnical engineering classes, including Introduction to Geotechnical Engineering, Theoretical and Computational Geomechanics, and Advanced Soil Mechanics. Her research focuses on geotechnical earthquake engineering, particularly subsurface characterization methods and biomitigation of liquefaction hazards. She is a past co president and creator of EERI SLC and is currently the PSU EERI student chapter's faculty advisor. Let's welcome Diane Mon. All right, thank you, Hassan. And of course, thank you to the YMC for putting on this webinar. Um, so my, my presentation today will be on incorporating demonstrations into both an undergraduate class and for outreach demonstrations for a broader, broader audience. And I'll finish off the presentation by going through some of the resources that I've found useful. So starting off with classroom demonstrations in an undergraduate class. Uh, the class that I'm specifically looking at is um, CE341 here at Portland State University, uh, Introduction to Soil Classification and Soil Properties, also known as Introduction to Geotechnical Engineering. The students in this class um, are in their third or fourth years here at Portland State as civil engineering majors. Uh, we're on the quarter system, so we have a lecture two times a week for two hours apiece. Uh, classes are up to 45 students, and then in addition to the lecture time, they also have um, a three-hour-ish lab section every week that's run by student TAs. Uh, objectives for the class, since it is introducing geotechnical engineering to these students, um, are to understand and communicate within the basic language of soil mechanics, understand the fundamental concepts of geotechnical engineering and their relation to civil engineering problems, and perform basic geotechnical engineering calculations and apply concepts to typical engineering situations. So some of the demonstrations that I use in my class that I'll be presenting today. I apologize, my screens are lagging a bit. So 
why I use these classroom demonstrations. Um, and first of all, I'll say that the demonstrations I talk about today and that I use in my class, um, they're very short and I can quickly perform them um, in the class and then move on with the lecture. Those of you that are in the quarter system, you know um, how precious time in it is and how valuable it is, how quickly we can get behind in the quarter and how hard it is to catch up. So these demonstrations tend to be short um, and the goals of them are to relate fundamental cell mechanics to physical processes and what we learn about in the class. Um, uh, it gives us a chance to demonstrate laboratory tests before the students go to the lab. So as we learn about them, the tests and their outcomes in the class, um, students get a visual of what that lab test looks like and then they go and read it in the lab manual. And then when they get to the lab, they're just slightly more prepared. Um, it's a chance to engage different learning styles and with those two hour lectures, it's a chance to break up the monotony of the lecture and to introduce maybe a little bit of fun as well. So the demonstrations that, I, that I'll be going over today, and I've taught this class three times now. So each time I introduce or try and incorporate a couple more demonstrations. And these are some of the ones that I use right now. Um, hydrometer testing, a demonstration called Water Does Flow Uphill, the Iron Glove Experiment, and Consolidation of Potato Chips. So starting with hydrometer testing, and this is, um, hydrometer testing is a very standard test used in geotechnical labs, and it's used to estimate particle size distribution for fine grain soil fraction. Uh, the picture on the left, that, that's the hydrometer there, and it starts by um, making a slurry and suspending it in this graduated cylinder of water. And then um, as you let the part, soil particles settle out over time, the buoyancy of the, the, the soil, um, suspension slurry, it changes, and that change in, in buoyancy is measured with the hydrometer that you can just see peeking out the top there. And so you look at how the buoyancy of the solution changes over time and relate that to soil particle um, size distribution. So with this demonstration, um, I introduce it into the lecture and start, I usually prepare it a day or two ahead of time, and then uh, we run the test during the lecture. And so I have some students come up and they help me get it set up and run the first few measurements. The measurements come very quickly at first, at like 30 seconds, one minute, two minutes, um, and it's a little bit frantic and fun. Um, and then as the measurements become further and further apart, um, I have a student set a timer so that we're, we're notified when we need to take the eight minute, 16 minute, 32 minute uh, measurement. And it's fun if the, the, the timer goes off with, a, with an alarm and it interrupts the class, especially early on in the quarter when um, when the material isn't too, too technical. Uh, so after I've recorded these, these measurements, you can see an example of recorded measurements down there in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, I incorporate them into the next homework assignment. And so um, from this demonstration, the, the learning objectives that come out of it is that students should be able to describe how to conduct hydrometer tests and understand how, how they work. Um, and then be able to interpret hydrometer test measurements and calculate grain size distribution from those measurements. The next demonstration um, that we'll look at, if I get to the page, there we go, uh, is called Water Does Flow Uphill. And this is a demonstration of soil water capillarity, where due to surface tension between water and soil particles, we get a capillary rise and the water rises up through the soil column. So looking down at the pictures at the bottom here, start with a column or cylinder full of fine Ottawa sand, and we submerge that soil column into a water bath, and you can start to see, this is early on after it's been submerged, you see that rise, the, cap capillary, um, the capillary rise up through the column, and then as the, the lecture progresses, we can keep track of what that capillary rise is reaching and how high it's reaching up through the soil column. So this gives a chance to explain uh, the theory behind why cap capillary rise occurs in soil. Uh, we can predict, given the soil properties of Ottawa sand, uh, how high that capillary rise is going to be. And then we can also calculate water pressure um, at certain points within the zone of ca capillary rise and also within the water bath. And I found this really useful for when students then progress to assignments um, and they're having trouble with them that I can call back to this demonstration and say, do you remember how we had that zone up above the water? It's like the water table and we have moisture or a zone of capillary rise above the water table. So I found it very useful 
um, in both lecture and then homework assignments. Next demonstration is called the Iron Glove Experiment. Uh, and this one is a demonstration for soil effective stress to understanding um, this fundamental concept uh, as the basis for soil mechanics and soil mechanics theory. So effective stress, it's an uh, essential for understanding soil stiffness and strength properties, which is what this demonstration shows. Um, you start with a glove here uh, on, the, on the left, which is full of that fine Ottawa sand. The glove is soft and weak. And then on the right, we put it under vacuum pressure and increase the effective stress significantly. So the effective stress increases from zero to something higher. You see that the glove is then full of stiff, strong sand. Um, and this gives students a chance to conceptually relate low soil effective stress to low soil strength and stiffness and conversely for high effective stress. Uh, this is a great demonstration for student involvement where you can have them offer to shake their hand with this weak, low effective stress glove. It's not a very nice handshake. And then once you apply the effective stress to it or increase the effective stress, it's a much nicer, stronger handshake. Um, this, uh, and then this can also lead to a conversation of where effective stress is important in geotechnical soil problems um, or geotechnical processes, such as slope stability, where soil strength is quite important, and then soil liquefaction, where soil loses its strength as the effective stress of the soil goes to zero. Now, when I think about carrying out a class demonstration, um, I, I've kind of broken it out and outlined it here into three different steps for it. And the first is to start to introduce that concept or theory. And I like to use pictures and examples to show why it's important for engineers. Um, so for example, with the topic of consolidation settlement, um, the Leaning Tower of Pisa is a, a very prominent example of excessive consolidation settlement that led to um, differential settlement um, over, over a long period of time. Um, and then also a picture on the right uh, showing wick drains to start to introduce the students that drainage is important for consolidation settlement. Then after introducing the topic and why it's important, I'll provide a bit of a technical introduction to it. So on the right, I'm showing my board notes um, for introducing consolidation. Um, and they're just, they're summarizing that if we apply a load to saturated soil, over time, the water gets squeezed out and, um, and then settlement follows due to that water being squeezed out um, of the soil. And so as engineers, we want to know how much and how fast that consolidation is going to occur. And then it, we also need to understand that drainage is an important part of consolidation settlement. Demonstration that I've started using to show consolidation settlement, um, it's the consolidation of potato chips. So we start with a bag of potato chips that is sealed. And we put a load on it and the pressure inside the potato chip bag increases but it's still unsteady because we're just we have increased pressure there and this and the chips or the soil particles are not making good contact with one another. But then when we introduce drainage into the chip bag, where I'm taking a safety pin and poking a small hole in the chip bag, now that we have drainage, when we add the load on top of that chip bag, we'll get um, we provide a pathway for that the air in the bag to, to dissipate and escape and relieve that pressure. And you can see that, I don't know if you can hear, but you can see the bag kind of shudder as, as it settled into the chips. And under that increased load, we get more settlement and it's gonna be much steadier under these loads. So we've consolidated this bag of chips by providing drainage and putting weight on top of it. So objectives, learning objectives from this demonstration would be that students are able to explain consolidation settlement in simple terms, um, and that they can also identify that drainage is required for consolidation settlement. The last note I'll make about um, classroom demonstrations is uh, just a note about student engagement for these. Um, of course, demonstrations offer great opportunities for student engagement, um, both inside and outside of the classroom. So I found it uh, great to brainstorm with current students for future demonstration ideas of what, um, what demonstrations would help them learn a concept now that they're looking back at the class. Um, 
And then you can also have these students or encourage them to design and build that demonstration for a senior project or extra credit. So um, the pictures here are showing <clears throat> uh, students from my class last quarter who, um, who offered to build for credit this quarter uh, a seepage demonstration tank after I showed the demonstration um, on YouTube in the class and said we would, could really use one of these um, if anyone's interested in building that. Um, so the picture in the middle is them with the tank that they've had constructed, and then on the right is for a liquefaction tank, um, just experimenting with the design parameters for that tank. Um, I've also found it fun to bring in past students to help with demonstrations. Last quarter, I had a student, um, or I should say, uh, in one of my past classes, I had a student that was quite interested in teaching, and so I had him come in to help me with the iron glove demonstration this quarter um, to encourage and embrace his enjoyment of teaching. So now, moving on to uh, demonstrations for earthquake engineering outreach. And I'll start with uh, some of our objectives, at least for us here at Portland State University, for doing um, outreach. Uh, the first is to engage student and community members with how <clears throat> civil engineering, geotechnical engineering, and earthquake engineering affects their lives. Um, here in Portland, we also have a bit more of a regional objective. Since we are expecting a large earthquake within our lifetimes, we want to be able to emphasize um, and raise awareness for the public of, um, of a potential earthquake event and strong earthquake shaking here in Portland, which also gives us a chance to dispel myths um, that they might have acquired about um, earthquakes, earthquake preparation, and earthquake engineering um, here in Portland, um, and also just kind of encourage advocacy for earthquake engineering as a whole, or earthquake engineering and earthquake preparedness within Portland. Um, it's also a chance to spark engineering enthusiasm in K-12 students, and of course, for those that are putting on the demonstration and the students attending it as well. Hopefully, they're having fun. The first demonstration we'll talk about, and um, I should say that the outreach demonstrations I'll be talking about today, they're all very, um, uh, uh, most of the parts can be ordered off of Amazon for not very much money, and they're all very transportable. So very kind of low maintenance, um, low tech experiments, but I think, or demonstrations, but I think that they are still fun and effective. So the first is a mini seismic design competition with spice drops and toothpicks, or um, toothpicks and marshmallows, or with connect structures. And these, depending on what level of students um, are there at the outreach event, they, they build structures. Um, some are higher for older students and some are lower for um, younger students. And then they can test it under different loading conditions. I like to bring um, a weight to see if it can uh, support weight onto the structure um, and then test it in like lateral loading and encourage them to like apply bracing to increase the stiffness of the structure as well. Um, and then, of course, they can test it under earthquake shaking. And this could be just like take the building and shake it, or if you have access to a shake table, that's another option, which is quite fun. Um, on the lower right there is a low-tech shake table at um, an open house outreach event at UC Davis. Um, and there's designs or instructions to build these low-tech shake tables available on Design Hub. Um, and then I'll also point out that Kelly Doyle at University of Nevada, Reno, she has put together great modules for um, these seismic design competitions for different grade levels um, as well. So that's another great resource. Uh, another demonstration that I like to use is uh, for sand liquefaction. Uh, and this is a bucket of saturated sand with a brick on top of it that represents a building. And for this bucket of sand, we apply an earthquake to it. That's a grad student applying the earthquake with um, a mallet there. And you can see that the sand undergoes liquefaction. We have water rising to the top, and the brick building is starting to settle into that liquefied soil, just like this photo of a building here in the middle. So this gives us a chance to explain why liquefaction occurs um, and some some examples of liquefaction damage and why it's important to think about liquefaction or even make folks aware that this is a challenge um, that we as geotechnical engineers face for earthquake engineering. Um, and then, of course, I always like to leave on a high note with these that we can um, explain what we as engineers do um, to both um, predict what kind of damage will occur due to liquefaction and what can be done to prevent liquefaction damage. 
So carrying out an outreach demonstration, and I'll kind of center this around um, single degree of freedom demonstration. Um, so when I go to carry out an outreach demonstration, I like to, and of course this depends on uh, the age group or uh, whether it's an open house or a lab tour, but I like to start with a question to sort of engage the group and set the context. Um, in this case, okay, you're in an earthquake. Would you rather be in a short building or a tall building? And you can have uh, those who think, you can say, okay, you'd rather be in a short building, raise your hand, and that's what most folks do. If you'd rather be in a tall building, raise your hand, um, and it's maybe a couple of contrarians. Um, and then you start to explain the concept. Well, it actually depends on the type of earthquake shaking. And then you can pull out the single degree of freedom um, demonstration and show that, okay, when shaking is really fast, like a high frequency earthquake, the short building shakes a lot, while the tall building is nice and steady. And then conversely, if you're in a, uh, a very low frequency earthquake with large swaying motions, that tall building is shaking quite a bit, while the small building is quite steady. So and then you can tie it back to the, the role of the engineer and the scientist and say, well, so engineers and scientists, they work together and they want to predict the type of earthquake shaking that we expect and then engineer the structures to, to keep them safe in that predicted type of earthquake. And then you can also pass this, um, the module to students and try and get them to shake the t short building or shake the tall building and see how it goes. Um, one of the final notes I'll make here about outreach is I really encourage folks to engage undergraduate and graduate students in outreach or to engage in it if you are an undergraduate or graduate student. Um, I, I did grad school at UC Davis where um, you're expected to take part in outreach events almost the moment you step onto campus. Um, and this was great. It gives students a chance to practice communicating engineering concepts as well as their research for different levels and to gain confidence in it. Um, students also gain leadership skills by organizing these outreach events and organizing students to attend them. And there really is kind of a snowball effect where students' enthusiasm for outreach increases and they look for more events and they look to incorporate more and more demonstrations in it, and it becomes just sort of self-sustaining or self-run by the students themselves. So I just kind of make a note here to encourage you to find outreach events and to encourage your EERI student chapters to participate in them. Some additional supplies that I found useful to take to outreach events or have on hand, um, pictures to aid explanations, such as those pictures of liquefaction damage, um, also for the seismic design, the mini seismic design competition, I've enjoyed or I found it useful to use um, these pictures of the Salesforce Tower in downtown San Francisco, um, where on the middle picture here, you can see that bracing of the building during construction. And that just gives a chance to show students that this bracing helps a building, um, it helps with the structural integrity of the building. Um, and then, uh, Another thing that we, we have on hand uh, that our graduate student, Melissa Preciado, put together, um, information on different engineering careers, uh, such as this one for geotechnical engineering, uh, and then uh, university, college, or department promotional material as well. Uh, finally, uh, a lot of the work uh, that I presented here in this presentation, um, the resources from it come from the book Soiled Magic by David Elton, which is published by ASCE. Um, the U-Sugar website has a teaching aids um, section to it. And then a lot of materials available on Design Safe, particularly the Nice Hub Legacy K-12 materials for outreach events. Um, uh, another point is the Five Levels video series by Wired, if you're not aware of it. Uh, they're great examples of experts in different fields explaining their research or area of expertise to different levels, from students in grade one or two to high school to undergraduate students to another expert in the field themselves. So just great examples on science communication. Um, and then YouTube is always great in the classroom if you don't have um, a physical demonstration available. I've, I just show YouTube videos of that demonstration and then student enthusiasm can go a long way as well. And so with that, I'll say thank you. Um, my contact information, if you wanna follow up with me after this webinar, I'd be happy to chat. And um, again, thank you YMC and looking forward to Anahid's presentation.
thank you, Diane, uh, for such a great presentation. All right, guys, our next presenter is Anahid Berosi. The topic of her presentation is Learn by Doing, Engaging Students in Experimentation. Anahid Berosi is an assistant professor of architectural engineering at Cal Poly. She completed her PhD in civil engineering at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Prior to joining Cal Poly in 2016, she served in an instructional role at Tufts University. At Cal Poly, she teaches structural engineering courses in analysis, dynamics, nonlinear behavior, and reinforced concrete design. Her research focuses on large-scale experimental testing and computational modeling of reinforced concrete walls. She is the current Cal Poly EERI student chapter faculty advisor. She is past co-chair of the EERI YMC and co-president of the EERI SLC. Let's welcome Anahid. Thank you, Hassan, for that introduction, and Diane for sharing not only some really thoughtful classroom and outreach activities, but how to lay them out in an informed manner. Um, so as Hassan indicated, I will be discussing engaging students in structural engineering experimentation through the classroom. So the courses that I'll be covering that we teach here at Cal Poly will include structural dynamics, steel design, and then earthquake engineering. I'll focus on structural dynamics first. It is a course that I have taught numerous times uh, having joined the Cal Poly faculty. So this course is a lecture and lab uh, components and we follow the Chopra Dynamics of Structures textbook to introduce the students to fundamentals including single and multi-degree freedom systems and seismic analysis via response spectrum and response history analyses. So the existing course when I first took on um, the class did include brief conceptual demonstrations that use physical models during lecture um, the first one regarding resonance aligns pretty well with the one that Diane was pointing out with the three single degree of freedom systems with different heights where the students um, make qualitative observations about the differing responses, but there's no sensor systems to make quantitative measurements that can be analyzed in a more rigorous fashion. And then there also was some damping activities, but again, qualitative um, in nature. Um, in the existing course, uh, the lab component was entirely numerical analysis using MATLAB, and I've provided a few examples of what I mean by that. And then the homework was all calculation-based, so problems taken from Chopra, similar textbooks, or what we as faculty had devised. So after having taught in that mode for, I think, one or two quarters, um, I was really in, interested in doing a little bit of curriculum redevelopment and focused on experimentation as being that mode of clarifying challenging concepts for the students, engaging them in data collection and analysis, also making them aware that the smartphone that they carry around with them every day has tremendous sensor capabilities, including triaxial accelerometers, and also to share real-world scenarios of dynamics testing, analysis, and design. Like I said, I primarily did this by developing new experiments for the lab portion of the course but also new physical demonstrations to bring into the lecture classroom and adding multimedia activities to homework assignments. As Diane pointed out, student enthusiasm is huge when you're developing either outreach or doing a curriculum redesign. So I actually got a student who was in the class with me in that original mode of teaching who was excited about making improvements to the class. And so, um, the curriculum redevelopment became his senior project where he was designing, fabricating, helping impl implement curriculum, and then also conducting human studies research where we were surveying the students on their feedback with respect to the pedagogical intervention. Um, so just to give you an idea of what those small scale tests and demonstrations were, um, we'll start with what we did with the students in the very first week. They were testing uh, cantilever, single degree of freedom, vibration, 
running a free vibration test. Um, and as you can see in the video, they're applying a displacement and they have their cell phone mounted on the specimen. They're using an application that collects the triaxial acceleration data. Uh, this file can be sent as a CSV uh, via email. They can open it in Excel or MATLAB and they can more they can create plots and they can analyze the data. So not only were the students looking at different heights of these cantilevers, but they were also looking at different material types, including steel, plexiglass, and wood, and trying to assess how the dynamic response varied between these two specimens. Uh, the students weren't only conducting the test um, and extracting information from the measurements they made, but they were also using theoretical equations and using the geometry and the math and the material properties to predict what the natural period and the natural frequency of these structures uh, were and compare them with the experimental results. So this is a pretty simple um, small scale test to do with students that introduces them to the cell phone um, accelerometer app, but also analyzing data in MATLAB. So our next lab where we got to work with a single degree of freedom structure is in week three. In this case, we are examining the differences between inherent damping, having a swinging mass pendulum damper, and a sloshing liquid damper. And so from these videos, you can see student pulling back the structure to a given displacement and releasing it from rest will notice that the sloshing liquid damper damps out the motion quite quickly, while the inherent damping uh, continues oscillating for quite a while. So qualitatively, this is a really great example for the students. And then we also connected to um, industry applications of these types of tuned mass dampers and also sloshing liquid type dampers. The students plot their results here, some examples of what the plots might look like. Um, in terms of the system with just inherent damping, the damping is more or less linear. And so what I can ask the students to do with this acceleration time history is use logarithmic decrement method to calculate the damping ratio. With the nonlinear methods, that's more complex. So usually I'm just asking them to make kind of qualitative uh, comments on how those systems perform compared to inherent damping and to one another. Um, so the specific learning objectives between uh, for that lab is about looking at inherent damping and supplemental passive control devices. Uh, the students, other than calculating the damping ratio, as I mentioned, they can also come up with the damping coefficient, damped period, and frequency, which enables them for that linear, um, inherently damped scenario. They can produce an equation of motion and write an expression for the displacement time history, which are concepts that I'm reinforcing that they have seen in the lecture part of the, of the class. In lab four, we're investigating this idea of dynamic amplification as we approach resonance. So that would be that we get larger and larger displacements as the frequency input gets closer to the natural frequency of the structure. So we can see with the videos on the left, we were using our Kwanzaa educational shape table. I had two single degree of freedom systems, cantilevers with masses hooked to the top. And we can see that at a low frequency, uh, the taller specimen was oscillating uh, with very significant displacement. And then the one on the right for at a higher frequency, that shorter specimen was oscillating um, with a higher displacement. So the students began to understand this idea of resonance. Um, we repeat a very similar activity with a, a frame structure that has two stories and the students actually, I put them at the controls for the shape table and had them uh, run a frequency sweep. So they were um, increasing the frequency until the other students in the class told them to stop and said, we think you're at resonance because we're seeing really high displacements. So then they would kind of um, narrow in on what they believed um, the first natural frequency was and they could observe the first mode shape, and then they could repeat that, can continue increasing the frequency, and observe the second mode shape. And this was extremely helpful because we did this activity prior to them starting multi-degree of freedom um, systems and the eigenvalue problem where you solve your natural frequencies and mode shapes. 
So they kept this as kind of a visual reminder of what it meant when they were solving those problems. What did it mean to have different natural frequencies? What did it mean to have different mode shapes? So very helpful for them to see this in lab four prior to doing the calculations. So the learning objectives, as I've kind of alluded to, was to understand the concept of dynamic amplification um, and realize that our displacements become much, much larger as we approach resonance. Um, in addition to the videos that I've just shown, I was, I and the senior project student were able to conduct a frequency sweep on one of the single degree of freedom cantilever uh, structures. So we collected uh, acceleration time histories for sinusoidal forcing at 17 frequencies. They were able to plot that and um, identify the resonant frequency and use half power bandwidth method to determine the damping ratio. So that was like another skill that I wanted them to practice with experimental data that had been collected. This next slide that I'm showing uh, is moving us from the laboratory setting and now showing you a physical model that I was able to bring into the classroom. Uh, this is a multi-degree of freedom rigid diaphragm type building. The senior project student designed this so that it was reconfigurable. You can move your shear walls around in any configuration that you would like. Um, and so we had it set up in kind of an asymmetric configuration in the hopes that the students would understand what it means to have torsional issues in a building. We also have this mass exciter that's on top um, that we can reorient so we can activate different modes or just different behaviors. And the dial that you see at the bottom is the ability to change the frequency. Uh, so the students can also explore uh, natural frequencies for different modes in a multi-degree of freedom system that isn't just the frame that we place on the shape table. It's kind of a, a different scenario there. The student that was working on their senior project was also extremely excited about uh, simulation in a computer-based environment. So he was able to develop a graphic user interface in MATLAB. And what this allows the students to do is they can have up to six columns. They can change the location of those columns um, and their stiffnesses. They can change the dimensions of the diaphragm, height, weight, things like that, and they can click these different buttons to observe what are the various mode shapes of the structure and also how does it behave when subjected to a ground motion if you selected El Centro. Um, and you're also able to change the incident angle of that earthquake to see how that might change the response. So that was a very cool uh, kind of application that he came up with to experiment uh, virtually. In terms of the multimedia homework assignments that I mentioned that were added to the course, um, I just included a couple of links for just a few examples that appear in my homework. But my objective is to expose the students not just to the small scale tests and demonstrations that I can bring into the classroom, but also allow them to see how, say, a tune mass damper is actually implemented in a building like Taipei 101, or what kind of issues we're seeing with the Millennium Bridge with resonance due to pedestrian footfall and how the engineers were able to do testing of that structure and then come up with a redesign that resolved the problem. So these are just some examples and it's a mix of videos and readings that I try to expose my students to. And when they see this, they come into the classroom for the next lecture with more enthusiasm and more understanding and also that kind of visual or that case study example that stays in their mind so I can draw on, on that knowledge um, when I'm discussing the various course topics. So moving on to the steel design lab. So the version that I'm focusing on is taught by a colleague of mine, Michael Deigert. And this Structural Design Lab is pretty unique to Cal Poly. You'll notice that it meets for a very long period of time, three hours, and that's three times a week. So this is a lab where you are essentially working under practitioner faculty. So Professor Diger has his structural engineering license. He's a certified structural welder. In a past life, he was also a metal fabricator. So he has kind of all of the perspectives that one could hope for as a professor in terms of engineering, fabrication, construction, all of that. And the lecture topics in this course are to um, help prepare the students 
to design an entire building for gravity and lateral. So you can see here the course topics that are covered in the steel class. And just to be clear, this is our second level steel class. So they've already taken the fundamental steel class we would see in most civil engineering departments. And since we are an architectural engineering department and we focus on structures, they have two levels of the steel class. Um, in the course progression, we do focus on seismic. We're located in California. And so the students are exposed to special moment frame and special concentric brace frame design. And they are exposed to the seismic AISC manual, not just the steel manual. So Professor Diger's objectives with upgrading the course were to expose students to advanced seismic systems beyond what the course even covered before, which includes buckling restrained brace frames. Um, he wanted them to develop a better understanding of constructability. So he wanted them not to just stop with you know, doing their design calculations and putting together a professional set of drawings. He wanted them to learn how to fabricate um, those designs that they had come up with. And because we have a, a shop staff and he also had the skills to train them in the various fabrication um, skills that was part of the project. He also wanted them to be able to firsthand experience the seismic behavior of the various steel lateral systems they designed and to utilize sensors to quantify the structural response of those systems. And so the major modification he made to the course was to add a design build test project um, that hits on all of the components that I talked about. Again, this is an opportunity to engage students. And so we, I was able to work on the human studies component of investigating student feedback for this course modification. And then we had two undergraduates that were co-authors with us and they helped with surveying and collecting student data and putting together a publication on this educational intervention. So the large scale design build test project, the course instruction had to be modified a little bit from how the course normally runs. So in weeks one through three, students receive three hours of lecture and sometimes one on one small group discussion. Um, on general steel topics that were traditional in the course um, before the course modification. In weeks four through six, the new aspect is that one hour of fabrication um, occurs every class period. And then in weeks seven through nine, students were um, finishing up their project design, the fabrication. And there was a little bit of outside of class time that they needed to do the design and the fabrication work. In week 10, they got to test their structures they had uh, designed, fabricated, and so it was a very exciting time. Just to give you a sense of the facilities we're working with, we do have a high bay lab, we have some pretty modest testing equipment, and we do have several shop areas that the students can do uh, training and then can conduct their fabrication efforts. Um, the timeline of the project, this class has been taught multiple times in fall of 2017. That was actually Professor Digert's first quarter on campus, first quarter ever teaching. And so this was a really commendable undertaking for him to want in a 10-week quarter to have the students design, build, and test a simple frame with a uh, special concentric brace frame in it. And as he progressed through his kind of teaching career, he's added, um, so now they test two different uh, types of systems, including special moment frames. And then in the, the last quarter that I have shown here, um, the buckling restraint brace frames. So just to take you through that very last quarter, the students are involved in design. It's very collaborative. They're sketching. They're going into the shop to look at the materials they have access to. They are transferring this into formal CAD designs. Here you see they're fabricating. They're actually um, deconstructing the previous model because we reuse the frame and they redesign uh, gusset plates and braces and things like that. You also see June on the bottom. She is painting the zones that um, will potentially yield the reduced beam section and such and grinding away. So they have a lot of fun and also develop a lot of skills in that manner. The last set of videos is the testing. And so what was really uh, offer, like a great opportunity for the students is that a representative actually flew, flew in from Corebrace for this particular test. And you can see him standing in the middle of the 
brace section, and he's explaining the performance of their buckling restrained brace frame and also taught them about what products um, his company has and how they're designing and testing BRBs. So the objectives um, that were met by introducing this project were that students started to learn how to self-organize. They knew that they had deliverables of producing design calculations, of creating detailed shop drawings, of fabricating these various specimens. And so they had to come up with their own punch list of work items and delegate them amongst the 16 students in the class. They learned um, and practiced fabrication and testing skills. And as someone who does large-scale testing as a researcher, and I'm always trying to recruit students at the grad level and at the you know, upper division undergrad level to participate in that, the fact that Professor Deigert has modified the class in such a way has led to students to come out of that class with so much more self-confidence and enthusiasm to pursue future large-scale experimental projects. Um, prior students, they were more timid and had a lot of kind of like steep learning curve at the beginning, but now we have students that are just excited about this opportunity. Um, what's also unique about Professor Deiger uh, is he wants the students to investigate their best informed design decisions, even if they're mistakes. So as long as we're within the realm of fabrication safety and testing safety, he will allow them to make mistakes and understand the physical consequences. So they did design one of their special uh, moment frames that instead of having strong column weak beam performance, which is what we hope for, that we get some kind of plastic hinging in the beam and the column is preserved, there was a design error that led to the opposite, so weak column, strong beam, but the students probably would not have caught that in their calculations. A senior engineer might have and just said, go back and fix this. But when they ran a test and observed what happens when you make that mistake, they will never, ever forget it. So even the mistakes can be really important learning opportunities. Um, and then another outcome was now they have test results to compare with performance predictions. Our students are so used to just using the codes of practice to tell them predicted nominal mo or nominal capacities of members. But when they actually get to run tests and compare those physical results with the codes of practice, it is such a meaningful experience for them to kind of uh, compare the differences. OK. So moving on to the earthquake engineering course. So this course actually follows the structural dynamics course that I was speaking about at the very beginning. This is taught usually by my colleagues Peter Larson and Cole McDaniel. So the, the implementations of experimentation that I will be talking about are developed by those two instructors. So our earthquake engineering course, it has a lecture and a lab component. It's still utilizing the Chopra um, Dynamics of Structures textbook and introduces some concepts from the IBC. Um, predominantly, what we're trying to get the students to understand is how do structures respond to earthquake ground motions? And what are the linear approaches, like the equivalent lateral force procedure? What kind of results do we get with that versus um, doing some nonlinear analysis and in our case, the students use eTabs, which is one of the CSI, um, CSI software packages. So kind of they're seeing the whole range of how can you analyze a structure. So there's two major activities that we have in this class. One is conducting and shake table testing of Connect Towers, which is like very small scale. Many universities have access to the Kwanzaa shake table, or as Diane pointed out, you can make one out of PVC pipe and dowels. Um, and the other activity that they have in this class is actually shaking full-scale buildings on campus. So I'll introduce both of those to you. Um, with the small-scale shake table connect structures, uh, the example on the left shows you a student that's looking at a four-story building and looking at the response difference between what if I have no braces? What if I have dampers? What if I have braces? So those are the examples on the left. If we look at the right, these are students investigating what's the difference between having rigid diaphragms at each floor level versus flexible diaphragms. So you would take these structures and clamp them to the shake table, add some mass, and then just allow the students to run either some kind of frequency sweep or ground motion, whatever the capabilities of your shake table are, and then they can qualitatively observe the differences. 
this project right here is one of my students' favorites. Because I taught them dynamics, they are always trying to show me their solution for the base isolated structure. Um, and so this particular student group, I think they decided that their structure was going to be on a piece of cardboard that had suct tape on it covered in baby oil so that they could reduce their coefficient of friction between the cardboard base and the ground that it would be sliding against. And they also use rubber bands to um, you know, limit their translational and their vertical uh, displacement. So you can see their shake table test on the right. And then after this experience, we do ask the students to comment on what they thought were successes in their design, and then you know, critically examine where there's areas that they can make improvements. So that's the small scale testing. And then for the large scale testing, I will provide, we have two structures that the students look at. One is this uh, steel, we call it a trust structure. Um, it's uh, name on campus is Bridge House. It's located in a canyon uh, back behind campus. And so it actually has a permanently mounted linear mass shaker on one of the ceiling beams. And then for a master's project, one of the students deployed an array of accelerometers shown in red. So he was able to characterize the translational um, natural frequency and mode shape. And he did that work as like technical master's research, but then the advisors for his master's research, um, Cole and Peter, as I mentioned, they were able to take that kind of experimental setup and types of analyses and integrate an activity in their course um, that utilized uh, similar experiences for the upper division undergraduate students. Um, and then they also shake our building where my office is located. And so you have a little schematic of what type of, you know, concrete and brick wall systems we have. They deploy a uh, linear mass shaker and accelerometers, and then they can collect data about natural frequencies, mode shapes, and the students do develop ETABS models um, to predict the natural frequency and mode shapes and kind of compare their results and refine their models over the course of several weeks. So. Um, in case you were interested in any of the documentation for any of the activities that I discussed, uh, I have them listed here. Some of them come at it from more of the educational curriculum development perspective, and the last two with the um, force vibration testing of buildings, these are actually theses with all the technical results that ended up getting integrated into the classroom. So I want to end with some general comments. Um, because here at Cal Poly, we don't just implement things in the classroom, we actually study the efficacy of those, what I call educational interventions, um, and we survey students and we interview them. Um, what we have found probably is obvious to all of us that students find that these type of activities um, really illuminate what the real world seismic response and structures are, and they feel more engaged in the course topics. So I think enthusiasm about something breeds interest, and interest helps us, uh, you know, in the learning process. So what is my advice to other educators? I think Diane shared a good number of resources that I would just underscore, you know, these have legacy materials on design state, things like that. But a few that she did not mention that I'd like to touch on are the American Society for Engineering Education peer database. It's a repository online hosted by that organization where they keep all of their annual conference and um, also their regional conference proceedings. So lots of good ideas from educators there and also the ASC Journal of Civil Engineering Education. There are others. Those are always just my first two places to start looking for inspiration if I'm teaching a new course and I need ideas of what I could do. Um, both Diane and I, I think we underscored the value of um, involving students because they've probably taken the class with you before and they have ideas about how to make the class even better with different hands-on demonstrations, experiments, et cetera. And so I would highly recommend that you integrate these updates as part of a senior or a master's project work and engage those students in co-authoring educational papers. The other advantage is that as, as educators, we only have so much time to do everything. We love our classes to be super interactive, 
but engaging students and helping develop that curriculum takes some of the load off of us and gives a really great learning experience to that student that's developing the curriculum and also um, has huge impacts to every time we teach that course in the new mode with all of the new activities um, moving forward. And the last thing I'd like to leave you with, and this is how I prioritize the types of new educational interventions that I spend my time on, is sticking with the motto, make the class fun and interesting for you to teach as the educator. So if it is fun for me to teach, then a lot of times it's because I have activities that will also be fun and engaging and interesting for the students. So that is kind of what I always use to help me make my decisions. I want to say thank you, just like Diane. If you have any questions, please do contact me. And I'll pass it back to Hassan. Thank you, Anahid, for such an informative presentation. Uh, all right, now we can have any questions uh, from the attendees. I don't see any questions now in the question bar. Let's wait for a few more seconds to see if someone has any questions. Yumi Wang is asking something. Let me see. Question. Okay. Uh, will slides be shared? Will slides be shared? Will the slides be shared? I guess yes. Towards the end of the presentation, you will receive a follow-up email, and uh, it will be uploaded somewhere. Any other question? Okay, one more question has. Tyler Quick is asking something. Yes, both of them. Can we have the webinar resources for those who was late to attend? Uh, again, this video will be uploaded uh, in two weeks, so you can look at that. Thank you for the great presentation. Can you please share with us what application you used on the mobile phone to get the acceleration data? I guess it's for Anahit. Uh, I repeat the question. Can you please share with us the application you used for the mobile phone to get the acceleration data? Can you hear me, Anahit? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, there's, there's two because I am an Android user. My senior project student was a iPhone user, and he promised me that most young people are iPhone users. So he was using an iPhone application. I believe it was just called Accelerometer, which is very vague, I know. But the distributor is called Dream Arc. So just like a dream that you have when you're sleeping at night, and then Arc, like Arc Tangent. So D-R-E-A-M-A-R-C. And so because the, the supplier has a very unique name, it makes it easy to find. Um, and then the Android app, I think I was using Physics Toolbox and just the accelerometer part. Because I know that the Physics Toolbox has many other like sensor type applications as a package and it might actually cost something. But I was interested in, in free and pretty effective um, accelerometer applications. And I showed um, a slide with the report that the senior project student put together. And in that document, there's actually a, a sheet or two manual of how to use the iPhone uh, accelerometer Dream Arc app. So if you have questions about that, that's a great place to go. And if you have further questions, you can always shoot me an email 
and we can chat further. Okay, so I have a next question for Diane. Uh, have you done any demonstration to show the CPT penetration soil? Diane, can you hear me? Mm. I guess she's not here. Let me see. Can you hear me now? Diane, you... Oh, yeah, Sorry. yes, I can hear you. Uh, did you hear my question? Can you hear us? Having some logistics problem. Hi, sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. I'm sorry about that. Um, okay. We have. I did hear the question. We have a question. Answer it. Yeah, I, I repeat okay. the question. Have yeah. you done any demonstration to show yeah. the CPT penetration soil? So um, last spring, I was on a job where um, for a research project where we were doing the cone penetration test for that project. And I made like I edited to get together videos for the CPT, like showing us inside the truck, showing the CPT, showing the data that comes in real time from the CPT, um, showing the cone going down into the ground. Um, and that's as close to a demonstration I've gotten from the CPT. Um, and is showing that video of um, the instructional video of what we did for that project. Um, it would be great to bring students out into the field um, in one of our test sites here in Portland when we're doing a, a CPT job, but we haven't had those align very nicely quite yet. Okay, I guess that's all. Thank you. I can go ahead one more time. Mm. Yes, okay. All right, I guess uh, with that, I would like to thank everyone for attending the today's webinar. Uh, the today's YMC webinar is supported with funding from FEMA. Uh, more information about the ERI Younger Members Committee can be found at our website. The information about the PDH will be provided in the following email. Please do not forget to do a post webinar survey. Our next webinar will be in May 2020, and the information about the speakers will be posted once the time gets closer. With that, I would like to conclude. Uh, I wish you everyone a great rest of the day. Bye-bye.